In the Lost Woods is a forest guardian, made of the forest itself. The great Deku tree stands proud, watching over the Koroks and his children, the trees around him. He also watches over the Master Sword, the only weapon that can defeat Calamity Ganon. But how does he give the forest around him life? Well, I may have found the answer. In The Legend of Zelda, the Great Deku Tree has been an iconic character since the Ocarina of Time. However, today we will be discussing specifically the Great Deku Tree of Breath of the Wild. He lives in the Korok Forest in the middle of the Lost Woods. With him are the Koroks, these cute little guys made of wood with leaf masks. The Great Deku Tree is a father figure to them and gives them life. It is said that if he fades, so will they. How is this possible? The answer can be found right beneath Link's feet. I believe the Great Deku Tree is taking advantage of something incredible. Plants are actually way smarter than we give them credit for. In past videos, we've seen them move and even talk, but there's something more amazing they can do. Plants can communicate through chemicals called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. They use these VOCs to communicate with each other, animals, and fungi. Have you ever smelled a fresh cut lawn and thought, man, that smells good? Well, those are VOCs at work. That smell is the grass warning other grass that something is coming and cutting them down. They talk to each other through VOCs about all sorts of things. They give warnings about diseases, herbivores, injuries, insect attacks, and so much more. For example, when a plant receives a signal of an herbivore, it can release chemicals that make it either less appetizing to eat or even toxic. The Great Deku Tree is definitely using them to communicate with the forest around him, but how does he send them to the far ends of the forest? Well, there's more to the story. Earlier I mentioned that he gives nourishment to the Koroks, and if he fades, so do they. Well, this isn't too far off from real nature. I'm about to tell you something so cool it blew my mind the first time it was told to me. It's a big deal for plants, which means it's a big deal for us. It's called the Wood Wide Web. I bet when you think of the word fungus, you think of mushrooms, right? Well, this is only a small piece of the puzzle. Of the seven phyla of fungi, only one produces true mushrooms, and even then, that is only the reproductive portion of the fungus. This spider web-like material is the true body of the fungus. It's called mycelium. This mycelium then makes up a larger network with the plants called the mycorrhizal network. This is what we're going to be discussing today. How the mycorrhizal network functions and how the great Deku tree is the perfect example of it at work. We call it the wood wide web because, like the internet, it connects all living plant material in an area. They've been doing this for a very long time too. Actually, they've been connected to fungi since the first land plants even existed. All plants share a common ancestor, and that ancestor had a symbiotic relationship with mycelium in the soil. Fungi have been on land since the Cambrian period, over 500 million years ago. Some scientists even hypothesize that they've been on land since the Ediacaran period, 650 million years ago. Plants, on the other hand, have only been on land since the Ordovician period, 460 million years ago. Here are the basics. Mycelium is made of these tiny hair-like structures called hyphae. The hyphae connect to the roots of the plant. There are two types of mycorrhiza, ectomycorrhizas and endomycorrhizas. The difference is that the ectomycorrhizae do not penetrate individual cells, instead forming a structure called a hartig net. This net goes in between the cells of the roots. Endomycorrhizae penetrate the cell walls of the root cells and form a connection. They kind of burrow inside until they're fully connected, like plugging something into an electrical socket. These appear to be the most common type. Plants are able to distinguish between potential mutualistic partners and pathogens. They do this through a gene called the Common Symbiosis Signaling Pathway, or the CSSP. This pathway controls the immune response in plants by using hundreds of receptors that detect chemical signals from other organisms. When they find a partner, the roots physically change their structure to allow the fungi to start to colonize them. Okay, here's where things get really cool. The plants up top perform photosynthesis like normal. Sugars are stored in the roots of plants, so they travel down the phloem, a part of the vascular network, to get to the roots. Some of this sugar goes to the fungus. Now I know what you're thinking, this has got to be parasitism. The fungus is stealing sugars, but it doesn't stop there. The fungus actually pays for the sugars through water and minerals like phosphorus. In fact, the fungus is six times more efficient at phosphorus uptake than the plant. Some plants have evolved so that they get all of their phosphorus from the mycorrhizal network. It isn't parasitism at all, but instead mutualism. It's an even exchange. This wood wide web is so popular with plants, up to 80% of them take advantage of the mycorrhizae. Orchidaceae, the orchid family, need mycorrhizae in order to even germinate. 
And some plants release hormones called strigolactones, which cause fungal spores in the soil to germinate. These hormones also cause the fungi to spread larger and attract them to the roots of the plant. In turn, the fungi release their own chemicals to communicate with the plant. So why fungi? Well, the hyphae of the fungus are much, much smaller than the roots of a plant. This means that they have more surface area to gain minerals and water from the soil. Not to mention, some minerals and nutrients are in organic compounds, such as dead animal or plant matter. Fungi are decomposers. They're able to break down these compounds for the plant to use. If the plant continues to supply the sugars and keep the fungi alive, then the fungi will give some of these minerals and water to the plant. Remember, sharing is caring, and plants are the proof. It doesn't stop there either. The mycelium release toxins into the soil that kill harmful organisms such as nematodes. They also act as a vaccine. Having a relationship with the fungus causes the plant to have a stronger immune response to pathogens. The mycorrhizal network also helps the plants grow in soil with heavy metals. There are plants that use the mycorrhizal network to attack other plants. This process is called allelopathy. This is when plants send out chemicals in the soil that inhibit the growth of other plants, thus limiting competition. Probably the most famous example of this is Juglans nigra, the black walnut. It releases juglone, which causes the plants around it to have trouble taking in water, limiting their growth. The mycorrhiza actually spread the juglone further from the tree, creating a larger chemical footprint. Now, this is all really cool, but what does this have to do with the great Deku tree? Well, he's known as the father of the forest. He gives life to the Koroks in the woods around him. And this is where things get crazy. Trees actually have a hierarchy in nature. The biggest trees get the most sunlight, therefore get to photosynthesize more. This leaves the little trees kind of struggling to survive. They're shaded so they don't grow as fast. The larger tree would have to fall in order to give them the space they need to grow. But this is where the mycorrhizal network steps in. Trees are able to call on others for help or warn them. They communicate. Well, quite a bit of the time they're sending these signals through the mycorrhizal network. They send VOCs to each other. A good example of this would be insect attacks. When an insect like a caterpillar starts to eat a plant, it can send out signals to nearby plants through the fungi. Then those plants can prepare for the attack by releasing their own VOCs that repel the caterpillars or VOCs such as methyl salicylate that attract insects that feed on the caterpillars. The fungus still benefits in this situation because its sugar source is saved. But that isn't all they send each other. Trees can actually recognize their offspring and siblings. Yeah, it's wild. They can send these family members nutrients and sugars. You heard right, the parents will send their children school lunches essentially. But why would the fungi do all of this work being a middleman for baby tree lunchtime? Well, they get to keep a bit of what's sent. Think of it as a postal fee. In fact, they can keep up to 30% of the sugars that are sent. You know what this means, right? The great Deku tree is the biggest and oldest tree in the forest. His roots go deeper than any other tree and have more mycorrhizal connections. He's the one sending out the nutrients to his children, including the Koroks. If he were to fall, the mycorrhizal network would be out of balance and would have to take time to correct itself with the younger trees. In the real world, our mycorrhizal networks are in trouble. Deforestation is causing the fungal networks to die with the trees. A big factor in mycorrhizal destruction is actually farming. When farmers till the soil, they're disturbing the mycelium. They also spray fungicides to kill off the harmful fungi, but this in turn also kills off the mycorrhiza. Poor crop rotation means that the plants can't get established into the network easily and the nutrients are gone. It sucks to see it, but we're destroying one of the most important parts of our ecosystem that many people don't even know exists. But how can we help? Well, if you have a home garden, refrain from tilling the soil every year. This will give your plants a better start as they can connect with the network almost immediately. Reduce your use of fungicides. These can run off and ruin the networks of mycelium far away from where it was sprayed. And make sure you're helping to fund proper research into fungal disease resistant plants. This means we don't have to spray fungicide and the plant can still connect to the network. Also, just doing our best to fight climate change will protect our arctic mycorrhiza from warming too much and keeping chemicals out of the air like sulfur dioxide will protect the mycelium from chemical damage. This is going to be a strange one, but try to avoid phosphorus heavy fertilizers. High phosphorus can stop the growth of mycelium. If this happens, then it will have a harder time sending nutrients and water to the plant. Remember, plants have a hard time picking up phosphorus on their own, so this would actually lead to a deficiency. The great Deku tree is truly a monument to the mycorrhizal network. He stands guard over his children and sends aid through the fungi beneath the soil. 
The Koroks can flourish thanks to this amazing network of plants and fungi. They're able to tap into it and thus receive the same benefits as the trees around them. Thanks for watching. Sorry for the short break between videos, but spare time to work on them has become a bit hard to come by these days. I hope you enjoyed it though. If you did, please like and subscribe. Make sure you ring the bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. And leave a comment. I love hearing from you guys and getting suggestions on game and topic ideas. If you want more content, then you can find me on Twitch at Video Game Botanist. I try to stream Wednesdays and Saturdays. I'm changing the time to 7 to 10 though to fit better with my work schedule. I hope to see you there. That's all for this one. See you later.